Welcome. I am Sister Who. Someone remarked, well, actually, I got a, an email letter from uh, Sister Mary Mary Quite Contrary in Australia. And uh, there was some question uh, going around uh, that uh, he, she was wanting a response to. Um, as to whether we were nuns or not. Uh, that someone had said we were a parody. And I was thinking about that, and it seemed to me that in actuality we're kind of all a parody of each other, and everything is a parody of everything. Um, and there's no real way to tell who's, who everything is a parody of, because we can't figure out where it all started. I mean, it's just like a family tree that goes back further and further through time. You know, and uh, there's actually quite a number of um, gay nuns, I guess you would call them, uh, around the world. And uh, I'm in contact with a number of them. But, uh, of course, we all have a very different range of perspectives and ways of doing things. And m many of the names are double entendres, uh, meaning um, it has two meanings. My full name is Sister Who Does She Think She Is, which is both an exclamation, because there is a certain audacity to being a gay man and dressing up in a nun's habit and, and doing this sort of spiritual ministry seriously. At the same time, it's also a serious question. And along that line, I will frequently address issues or, or things related to one's own identity. Who does she think she is? Who do I think I am? Who do you think you are? Who we think we are has a lot to do with how we present ourselves in the world. For various others of the sisters, some of them tend to focus on AIDS-related uh, education. Some tend to focus on political activism. Uh, a few others, like myself, tend to focus on spirituality. It, it, there's as many different things going on as, as there are, I suppose, within uh, the more traditional realms of, of Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Anglican, or even Buddhist nuns. Each different order, each different group, each different person puts another unique spin on it. Which is why in one book I read, uh, the author suggested there were as many genders, as many kinds of people as there are people, because each one of us has the opportunity to put a different spin on whatever we are. Perhaps sisters like myself are some sort of uh, postmodern version of uh, spiritual service or the sacred clown. Um, the sacred clown is, a, is uh, an archetype, a general sort of person that I think you'll find an example of in just about every tribal society throughout human history. It's a person who would sometimes be funny, but more often they would be the one who challenged the people to think and made new ways of looking at things and new ways of understanding things. Uh, often when they would do mysterious sorts of things, um, things that weren't readily understood. Um, one of the things that I understand is also involved with being a sacred clown, is helping people to remember how to think metaphorically, how to look at things symbolically, how to, how to see the rain and understand it, among other things, as being a metaphor or, or possibly having the metaphor of washing the earth, um, of the snow being uh, just the right sort of insulating blanket to live through the cold winter months of relationships between people, indicating something about the people by the way they act. Therein becomes the real challenge of understanding things metaphorically, though. And that's where I think the sacred clown especially is most needed, to help people to understand what's going on in a particular interaction. For example, when someone acts a certain way, when they tell me that I'm just a such and such, or I shouldn't do that because, and I need to understand that what 
they're saying reveals more of who they are than of what's true about me, of what I truly should do or what I truly am. And watching the way people interact with their families and with society and understanding the communications, the metaphorical communications that are coming across. Um, one of the more obvious things being when someone says, if you want to know what's important to you really, look at where you spend most of your time. And someone might, be, might answer, well, but these are things I have to do. They're my, my duties, my job assignments, my responsibilities. Well, I agree to a point, but if they really weren't important to you, I think you'd find a way out of them. Because other people who, for whom those things weren't important did find a way out of them. And so on some level, there's something going on. And I don't see any of this to point fingers or to judge people because that's not the purpose of metaphorical communication. The purpose of metaphorical communication is to understand things in multidimensional ways. That it's not just the physical that you see, but there's also a spiritual aspect and a social aspect and a mental aspect and an emotional aspect non-tangible aspects of who we are, who each of us individually is, and what our actions and our responsibilities and our choices say about those realities. To take that to a proactive level where you actually make your actions something positive that works for you, that's where I saw a lot of wonderful examples of that growing up in the Roman Catholic Church. There's a lot of things about the Roman Catholic Church I'm not fond of, but there were a lot of things there I saw that I liked. That when you wanted to illustrate something, there were banners and objects and colors and all sorts of demonstrative ways to illustrate. And that's kind of what this whole multidimensional thing is about that when, oh, for example, a real common one, just to use something that everyone can relate to, a marriage ceremony. In a marriage ceremony, certain things are exchanged, certain things are given, certain rituals are done together. In uh, pagan weddings, for example, there is a long-standing tradition of jumping over a broomstick. Um, a, one translation of this, I think, was the tradition that got started somewhere of the groom carrying the bride over the threshold of the new house. The, the broom is a symbol of both masculine and feminine qualities. The, the flare of the broom being like a skirt and, and the pole of the broom actually being rather phallic. Um, so it combines masculine and feminine elements in a single object. By jumping over it together, there was a sense of bringing their masculine and feminine qualities together to build a new home by carrying a bride over a threshold. It's a demonstrative way. It's, it's a multidimensional act because in one sense you're doing a physical ob action. You're, one person is carrying another person over a threshold, over across a certain distance in space and time. At the same time, it's a symbolic gesture because of the things that it means that they're entering this new home together and they're going to build a life together and they're committed to each other. So that's two different dimensions of reality, a physical dimension and a social dimension. And there's probably a, an emotional dimension as well that by willing to do that, to, by being willing to do that together, it's a demonstration, uh, a symbol of the love they feel inside for each other. And the love they feel inside for each other would not be any less real if it were not demonstrated but it would quite possibly not be known. I, I recall hearing the joke once of, about, uh, oh, some inspirational speaker going someplace to speak on, on relationships and trying to emphasize that the people whom you love, you need to tell them that you do love them. And as the joke goes, there was a man in the front row who promptly informed the speaker that he had told his wife that he loved her when they got married 25 years ago and he would let her know if he ever changed his mind. And, yeah, which is an amusing sort of joke.
But the point is, if you love somebody, you need to tell them. 25 years ago, even if it was the most incredible ritual in, in, in your life, frequent reminders of things that are already known. I, I, I don't think there, it's possible to be too redundant in telling someone you love them, if you mean it. There is a possibility, I think, of using the words, I love you, to the extent that they don't mean anything. It's putting the cart before the horse, getting things in backwards order. The commitment, the expression, has to come from the inner reality. In the Bible, Jesus said, out of the heart the mouth speaks. If it's not in your heart and the mouth speaks anyway, it's going to be hollow. It's going to be... Mm, you could even create a sense of being betrayed by the words... It's like a promise that's not delivered. If I say I love you and I do nothing to ever show that and I never tell you, it's like a broken promise. It needs to be real inside. In being real inside, it also needs to be expressed. To jump to another metaphor, I like climbing mountains, and but to me it, it's very important that there be a summit to reach. And I had a, a discussion with my life partner once about this because he's climbed a number of mountains as well. Um, I think when when we first met, he told me he'd been up the three highest mountains in Mexico and glaciers in Canada and all sorts of stuff. But in any case, he had once thought of establishing a club which believed in hiking mountains and stopping 100 feet short of the summit and not going any further in protest of those people who hike a mountain only for the summit. And I said, well, if you're looking for wholeness, completeness, it seems to me you need a starting point, you need a trailhead, you need a hike that you pay attention to, a journey, and you need a summit, you need a destination. This is not just walking in the wilderness for the sake of walking. You're actually going someplace. But you're not just going someplace, you're also going through a lot of beautiful things along the way. To have a sense of completeness to a hike, you really need all three a destination, an origination point, and something in between that you pay attention to. And that's kind of the way life is too. We have a beginning and we have an end and we don't know what the end will be like because this is, metaphorically, life is a mountain that we've never reached the summit of yet and we don't until we die. And there's all this stuff in between that if it's just one mad dash toward the destination, we're going to miss a lot if we completely ignore that there is a destination, it may catch us by surprise and we will have left a lot of things undone that we really wanted to do and a lot of things unvalued that we really should have valued. But there's also something important about where you start from, the origination point, the trailhead. Where did it all begin? Because wherever it all began has a lot to do with what you bring with you on the trip. There was one time my life partner and I went on a backcountry hiking trip for five days. And because of where we parked the truck, we had to know where we parked the truck and we had to know where we were going and we had to know how far it was in between in order to know what we were starting the journey with. And for five days everything we had to deal with, had to fit in the frame pack that we carried across the countryside for 30 miles or so, you know, where there were no roads and there were no houses, no power lines, no telephones, no nothing. Nothing but wilderness. And so we needed to know where we started so that we knew what we had with us and what sort of situations we could deal with. We also needed to know where we were going so we didn't just wander aimlessly and discover that the provisions were running out and we still had a long ways to go to get back to the truck. But there was so much in between to see. If all we had seen was the truck in the parking lot at the trailhead 
and the final destination, we would have missed nine-tenths of the whole journey. The majority of the journey is what happened in between. But both ends were equally as important. Am I a nun? It depends on your definition. All the things we use for self-definition, all the things when I say, who does she think she is? Who do I think I am? All of the things depend on definitions. Am I a parody of none, or is a none a parody of me, or are we both nuns, just in very different ways? I, I obviously, I tend toward the latter. I, I think I am a nun because there's a sense of spiritual service about being sister who, as with tribal societies, uh, sacred clowns, myself included, have certain ritual tools, certain garments, certain objects they interact with that are treated with respect because they are specifically related to the ministry and the work that a sacred clown does. There are, there's a respect that I need to extend to the work of being Sister Who, and it's not something I do lightly. It's not something I make fun of. It's because of being a person involved with spiritual ministry who could easily be made fun of by others. I make a point not to make fun of anyone else's belief. Dialogue and discussion are one thing. Intentional satire is something that I personally don't do. I understand some of the other gay nuns that I know of engage in that sort of thing with specific purposes in mind. It's their choice, and I allow them their choice, I allow them their consequences. I choose not to make that choice. Um, and I don't mean that as, as being unsupportive of them either. I, I think people need to follow whatever's in their heart. And if you are disturbed about a particular situation, uh, a question of justice, or a question of uh, a family's living situation, maybe they don't have enough for their next Thanksgiving dinner, you know, whatever it may be, if you have the ability to respond to that, it, to me it only makes sense to respond and do whatever you can. But because there's a different calling, if you will, inside of each of us, some of us being called to be sacred clowns or gay nuns, some being called to be traditional nuns, some being called to be accountants, some being called to be lawyers and judges and politicians, there is something inside of each person, I think, that draws them toward an activity something they can feel passionate about. And those who are labeled lazy, in my opinion, simply haven't found the circumstances or the opportunities or the passion within themselves that would provide that kind of abundant life and that vibrancy to everything they do and that, that reason for getting up in the morning and looking forward to the day with all its problems there you know to me a realist is not a pessimist a realist has an understanding that negative consequences and positive consequences are equally possible absolutely equally possible i try to be a realist not to talk myself out of things and say well that'll never happen the world will never accept sister who, sister who will never have a legitimate ministry anywhere. I don't know whether I will or not. I, I do these television shows in the hope that someone is reached and someone is helped. I invite dialogue. If anyone disagrees, uh, I would love to talk about it with them and, and see where they're coming from and how they understand it from their perspective. But I do believe that there is a divine spark within each person and that ultimately we need to be responsive to that divine spark. We need to be willing to serve the work, whatever the work of our life is, whatever that inner passion is. We need to discover it and pursue it and live it and accept it as a gift from God. Whatever, however typical or anomalous, different it might be. I suppose in a lot of ways I've been an anomaly since the day I was born. Um, oh well, at least I guess I, I've gone through things and, and simply tried to find whatever I could in whatever situation to make it beautiful and to go somewhere with it. 
uh, I discovered I was gay. I, I don't feel like I ever had a choice in the matter. I, I knew I was different from the time I was four. Uh, it took a long time to understand what it was, though, in, in a world that wouldn't talk about what it was to be gay or wouldn't address that there was such a thing as a legitimate, true orientation. That there was such a thing as two men respectfully, genuinely loving each other and designing a relationship that suited them. To me, I don't know why it would be any more unreasonable than a man and a woman uh, choosing to have a loving relationship together and, and designing a relationship that suited their unique ways of understanding and pursuing life. And what of the question of gay marriage? I suppose someday it will be looked back on as why did we ever fight about it and, and even at the present time I'm not sure why it matters so much. Uh, to me it's a legal contract that has more to do with what laws you embrace than with anything ethical or moral and it's the government is simply a facilitative agency. It's not something that has the ability to get involved in the, the emotional, ethical choices of each person's life within any country. And un unless they are friends or acquaintances, I'm not sure there would really be a significant impact on each person. Beyond, beyond the simple impact of living in a diverse world where there's a whole lot more perspectives, a whole lot more ways of looking at things and understanding things. But it seems to me that anything that encourages a stable, healthy relationship of whatever description encourages society in general to be healthy and stable and creative and empowered. So why fight about it? With or without the legalities, however, to me the, the fundamental reality comes down to what happens in a neighborhood. Whatever happens in government offices, whatever they tell us to do with our lives, it's still up to each of us to say, I will be friends with this person, I will not be friends with this person, I'll treat this person that way, I'll not treat this person that way, whatever. To me it makes the most sense to make the choices that will allow you to have to contribute your best and most beautiful contribution to share that which is most uniquely you and most wonderfully you and in the same way by nurturing that in other people we all have the benefit of each other's gifts we all have the benefit of each other's perspective each way each other's way of understanding and when we begin to understand things from that many different sides it allows for I was going to say wisdom, uh, or somewhat of a counterpart to that, not exactly the same, but somewhat what some people call human intelligence, which the joke I keep hearing is that it's an oxymoron, uh, a, a self-contradicting term, that there is no such thing as human intelligence. Look at the human race and tell me there is. I have a hard time arguing with that, and yet it seems like that's a reasonable goal, that at some point we at least have the capacity to become more intelligent than we've been and to make wiser choices than we made and to embrace more diversity than we have and not to be threatened by it. To find in gay nuns a parody of ourselves, to find in ourselves a parody of the spiritual ministry that gay nuns do, to find in traditional nuns uh, a parody of what um, feminine spiritual service is about, to find in priests and ministers uh, a parody of, of what spirituality in, in various masculine and feminine forms is about. And what really is a parody except somebody's interpretation of something they saw, altered, interpreted, filtered by their own experience. If you see a particular type of person, a minister, a mother, a father, a business owner, an executive, some type of person in society, and your experience with them tends you to look at, encourages you to look at them in a certain way. If you're ever in that position, you may unconsciously wind up being a parody of what you saw. 
and may not be intentional, or it may be intentional. I don't think it's, it's a question of being good or bad, though. It's just a question of being different. And if you're doing an intentional parody, an intentional satire, um, a comedic impression or, or representation of someone, probably you have a reason for it. Probably there's something you want to get across, something that you want people to understand. And I think it's important to honor that intention and to listen. If someone has to go to that extent to get your attention to communicate something, probably it's important. So listen and find out what it is they're trying to tell you. And once they've been heard, maybe they'll find a more beautiful way to do it and it'll seem less like a negative satire. For my own self, it has more to do with dressing myself in symbols. I always kind of uh, really looked up to the priests when I was growing up as a little boy in the Roman Catholic Church with their multicolored garments and with symbols all over them and candles and bells and special belts and special jewelry and all sorts of things that they would wear to do these rituals and these performances in a sense. And it was fascinating. And when I discovered I was gay, I knew I couldn't do that. And then along came Sister Who, and I looked in the mirror and saw myself being Sister Who, and it was very surprising to me. And I've been very thankful for it, because in my own way, I get to make my spirituality beautiful, and I get to do things that everyone told me I couldn't do. And it's not just that they told me I couldn't do them, but it's, it's enlarging the meaning of the word possible enlarging my understanding of what is possible. Please join me again as we continue to expand what is possible in each of our lives. And may blessings, love, and peace be with you till then.